I think as we speak, the world is going through a horrifying process, the extent to which we have never seen before in human history. Over history, plagues have ravaged the world, often like the Black Death killing half the population of Eurasia. Sometimes it's even worse, like the outbreaks of European diseases, which killed 90% of Australia or the Americas population. We've accepted this to be part of the world as a society, and have used modern science to be much more durable against pathogens. However, the way the world works is that the problem most likely to kill your society almost always comes from a different dimension that you can't comprehend. After seeing the horror, you go back through the historic record and realize it was always a threat, you just didn't know where to look. I believe this will be one of, if not the greatest stories of all time. Our society is in the early phases of facing a mental health plague on the scale of the Black Death, and I believe it'll have similar effects of indirectly halving the world's population. That might sound strange, and it would have been even more strange ten years ago, but once you change a few assumptions in how your worldview works, you realize that this is already happening now. Try not to go crazy by the end of this video, gang. In my line of work, staying in the know is essential. That means having the latest and greatest software in my devices. I've discovered that Software Keep is just what I've been looking for. They offer authentic software at prices that pleasantly defy the status quo. Software Keeps boasts a diverse selection of internet security and software-related products for both Microsoft and Apple, which can benefit just about anyone. I've come across some fantastic deals in antivirus software and other services that have been real game changers for streamlining my business operations and keeping my digital life organized. Whatever you may be on hunt for, Software Keeps is your one-stop shop. And here's a little insider tip. They're currently running a fantastic autumn sale with discounts of up to 20% when you use my exclusive promo code, so why not seize the opportunity to upgrade your digital experience? Check out Software Keeps Autumn Sale and discover the solutions you've been searching for. One of the things that it's pretty easy for me to mentally navigate, and I'm shocked most people really struggle with or haven't reached, is I assume a lot of a society's collective wisdom and the academic consensus at any given time is just incorrect. The reason I say that is that if you look over the course of history, theories and paradigms come and go, often being heavily dictated by the political aspirations of the priest class at any given time. What I'd also say is that the biggest reason giant plans go afoul, or people make incorrect calculations about how the world works, is because there's some other variable they just haven't thought of, because the amount of things we don't know is infinitely large across the world. Even if you look over the course of modern science, you find that theories that people hold with religious-like certainty turn out to be completely incorrect. A hundred years ago, people believed that the best way to manage the economy was through state planning, that races were discrete things with different abilities, that all women envied men's penises and everyone wanted to sleep with their mothers and kill their fathers, that the universe operated under perfect clockwork Newtonian principles, that humans are inherently rational and more. We don't believe any of that today, but it was just the consensus that you'd be called an idiot for questioning a century ago. And the thing is, they also had the scientific method in exactly the same form, so we're using the same tools to validate our opinions today as they had back then. For me, I'll look at entire disciplines and aspects of society and view them as houses built on sand. I don't attribute malice to the people involved. They're mostly honest, truth-seeking, hard-working people who disagree with incorrect premises. Life is brutal, and there's infinite ways to be wrong, and only a couple to be right. I believe in the truth the most of anyone, I just think it's very, very difficult to reach. Back before the Black Death, Europeans were primed for a major plague without even realizing it. They didn't have a concept of germ theory, or how diseases actually spread, and so lived near their own shit, wouldn't clean wounds, didn't have a concept that cleanliness stopped illness, Families would all sleep naked in the same bed together, and loads of other things, they were unwittingly setting themselves up for a giant plague. 
we've done this in our society since our understanding of human psychology is so elementary that we actively do many things that are unwittingly setting us up for a mental health pandemic. In many ways, our understanding of human psychology is one of the least advanced of any society ever in human history. This occurred, as I explain in this video, as we turn science from a single tool used to analyze and arbitrate data to a god which we use to explain all of reality, and anything that science can't explain just doesn't exist. The first is that implicit in the scientific method is the removal of any external evidence from the experiment. This is necessary for the scientific method, which needs to isolate which variables are important through a test. However, in the real world, this is incredibly silly, given we exist in a complex web of existence in which context, common sense, and intuition determine absolutely every choice we make. You can't make an algorithm to figure out which friend you should trust, who you should marry, what business you should create, or how to win a war. These are things that require real knowledge of the individual context of that situation. This is why the right and the left disagree on every single thing about whether the nature of the human condition, economics, the universe, and life in general, since we don't have an appeal to common sense in our culture, given when we don't want to see something, we purposely ignore the context. A great example about how this works is that we didn't want to believe that there were any real psychological differences in men and women. We thus made it a taboo topic to study, so the science agreed with us. However, when people actually did study that topic, it turned out there were some real differences in how men and women think. And the thing is, that's what literally every other era of history would have told us, but we didn't want to see that, so we didn't look. The logical system our society has, or social constructionism, or the blank slate, literally believes that we construct reality to be whatever we want. This is how every side of the political spectrum has gone through a phase of saying they're the scientific truth, given they just study the things they want to see and ignores those that they don't. Thus, the scientific studies become mirrors of their own worldview. What's even worse than this is that we shame people who disagree with what are really our fantasies at how we want the world to be. If I say men and women are different, different cultures operate differently, or that war is a necessary part of the human condition, people will insult me and try to destroy my career, whether or not those are true, which further isolates us from the truth. Also on top of this, once you believe you make the reality of the world, you've removed the ability to do anything as a society. This is since if you can't agree on what's right or wrong, you can't form plans and thus get anyone to do anything as a group. This quickly spirals off into insanity, People like to think that science untrammeled from emotion, context, history, tradition, and more will create a utopia. The reality is that it goes insane, since there's nothing tethering it to the real world, and so instead it just reflects the fantasies of the imaginer. What this translates to is that we ignore things we don't want to see to push for utopias, which only then results in those variables crushing us when we push too far. Examples of this include how communism actually turned into genocidal slave states, how sexual liberation turned into massive sexual inequality, which ended up hurting women a lot, global warming, how colonial states meant to civilize were often brutal, and more. The second cognitive bug in modernity that lets this happen is that we are only capable of seeing things as discrete dead things that don't exist through time flowing forward. The reality is that all of existence is like water, constantly flowing around in every direction, with everything spilling into everything else, in that all things are connected. There's no concept that the world around us, especially our minds and societies, are alive. When you deal with a living thing, it activates a completely different part of your brain than a dead thing. For example, communism treats human societies as machines where you can cut out different gears, or social classes to re-engineer a utopia in the same way you would for a car. The reality is that societies are alive and holistic, and doing that's the equivalent of blowing up organs in a body. Once you kill the officers, church, nobility, yeoman, farmers, and more, you don't get a utopia, you get a broken society. One of the great ironies is that psychology and neuroscience have made incredible gains over the course of the 21st century. What most people thought would happen is this would cause an incredibly advanced scientific society, that we would remake the world with these new discoveries. However, the great irony is that these breakthroughs basically just validated the pre-modern world's concepts of psychology as correct. 
Most people in the scientific establishment haven't realized this, partially as said before due to how siloed modern science is, in that people don't think outside of the context of just their field. I'm going to use the European Middle Ages or early modern period as an example for this pre-modern view of psychology, given partially it's my own speciality, which I like talking about, but it's also the closest parallel to our current society of pre-modern cultures. However, keep in mind that basically every pre-modern society everywhere in the world, in every time of history, would agree with what I'm about to say here. Something that I touched on before is that most of the flaws in modern psychology stem from cognitive bugs we don't even think about. This is the biggest problem modern science always runs into. It doesn't take into account the biases the creator of the test doesn't even know they have. One of the cognitive bugs we have is something Charles Taylor talks about in his book A Secular Age, his book which compares the medieval religious worldview to the modern secular. Or he talks about the buffered personality, in that our view of psychology is individual, while the reality is its collective. If you look at modern psychology, all the interventions for problems are on an individual basis. If you're depressed, go to a therapist and talk out your issues. What we've learned, and what the rest of history already knew, was that psychology is a group and ecosystem problem. People's psychologies aren't individual, but are often controlled by how the society manages itself. In John Haidt's book The Happiness Hypothesis and Johann Hari's book Lost Connections, both of which are amazing books that I highly recommend you read, they talk about the dominant factors that drive mental health issues are weak community, lack of religion, grueling work conditions, trauma, weak families, poverty, and lack of beauty. We found that material comfort and wealth tend to not have very high degrees of effect on happiness. They tend to in the short term, but then people get used to it and it becomes a new baseline. If we look to celebrities, this is the case, where once they realize that even with the money, fame, and sex, they're still depressed, they tend to hit rock bottom. If the assumptions that feed into our materialistic worldview were correct, celebrities would be the happiest people in the world, but we all know that that's not true. Something I'll throw out is that actively being in poverty does affect your mental health, where if you're barely getting by and you're struggling to make sure your kids are okay, that will put a lot of strain on you. However, moving from the middle to upper class, you see rapidly diminishing returns and happiness for greater wealth. We know that our theory of psychology is inadequate to the reality of the human condition, given that we have the worst mental health in history, something I'll talk about in greater depth later on in this video. However, therapy, which is the big catch-all for all of our society's issues, has been ineffective at dealing with all these issues. Therapy has its place. As a person with PTSD, I can comfortably say that EMDR trauma therapy has literally saved my life. However, talk therapy, which forms the vast, vast majority of modern therapy, is incredibly ineffective at solving underlying psychological issues, especially so for men. You can correlate rising amounts of Americans going to talk therapy, which has skyrocketed over the last few years, with rising mental health problems. What this means is that traditional therapy has been completely ineffective at dealing with our society's rising mental health crisis. This is going to piss a lot of people off, but religion and community are statistically much, much more effective than therapy. I understand this varies from condition to condition, where if you have a serious mental health issue, going to church won't solve that. And the problem is that most churches and communities are out of touch for what people really need. But a person who is both religious and has a strong friend network is more than $30,000 a year happier and more psychologically stable than a person who doesn't. Strong interpersonal connections in religion are the biggest factors for happiness. This is why the vast majority of the human race over the course of history has lived in poverty and not killed themselves and in fact had better mental health than we do today. This is why Westerners will go to Guatemala or Egypt and say the people there are happy. I'm not saying material wealth doesn't matter, especially for people in deep poverty. However, we've massively overestimated its importance on our mental health. These are things that individuals can control up to a certain degree. And I'm a classical liberal, and no one believes in individual responsibility more than me. However, let's be real. If you're born a peasant in Uganda, it's not your fault that you're not going to become a wealthy tech VC mogul. The things above are really supplied by the society and the society's responsibility. However, the problem is that our society has completely abdicated responsibility on every single one of those issues. 
This is a concept that existed in the pre-industrial world. The reason pre-modern societies did things that seem insane to us, like burn witches, heretics, enforce religious dogma, launch crusades, and more, is since they viewed the collective mental health of their societies as something to be defended against encroachments in the same way that a nation has to be protected against foreign invaders. Witches were burnt because they were destroying the shared collective health of the society through their nihilism. This worldview was in many cases pushed too far, as we can see from how the openness associated with modernity was able to do so many incredible goods. In the Middle Ages, there was a concept that the church existed as warriors against demonic invasion, in the same way the knights fought for the nation's physical safety. Pre-modern cities and villages had various rituals to protect the collective spiritual stability of the society. This is why the ancient Romans got so angry when the Christians didn't sacrifice to the gods, since if some people didn't sacrifice to the gods in the city, the gods got angry at the city and punished the entire population. This is a proxy for how when a society loses good values like hard work, courage, or humility, or respect for the gods and thus the natural order, the entire society suffers. If you told someone in the Middle Ages or any part of the pre-modern world that we lived in a culture without a church where there was no community, no beautiful art, that we only believed the material world existed and more, they would say that our society would be so corrupted as to start experiencing demonic possession before complete social collapse. The concept of demonic possession sounds insane in our current society, and we've been trained from childhood to view it as insane and silly. But it makes sense if you tilt your point of view 30%. Guys, I know a lot of you will struggle with this, but please wait until the end of the video before judging. We know psychologically that the human mind is split between multiple competing sub-personalities. This is what the field of family systems therapy teaches. These different sub-personalities are competing for influence over your mind, and the healthier a person's psychology is, the better integrated these sub-personalities are, in the same way that in a healthy family they're not constantly fighting each other. In bad psychologies, they're openly at war, destroying the person's ability to function. Most people have no clue who they are, and if you tell them to write an estimation of their character, and you show it to their friends, their friends will often laugh at how off it is, and if you tell them to write a plan for the next week of what they'll do, they'll get it off. And the thing is that people do not understand how little control over themselves they have. And the reason you get angry at your wife, even when you know she doesn't deserve it, or you can't write the fantasy novel you've always wanted to, is that your estimation of yourself is not yourself. It's a small ego attached to giant subconscious forces that are really in control of you. As a person with PTSD, I'm aware I'm not in control of my entire body. I purposely avoid crowded events, incredibly stressful situations, and purposely more introverted given I know that if something goes wrong, I can literally lose physical control of my body. For people with bad PTSD, the sub part of their personality can seize control and make them do terrible things. Can someone explain to me how that's different from a demon? Ironically, modern therapy tells us to deal with trauma in the same way that the pre-modern world told us to deal with demons. This is by holding ourselves to an objective moral standard while accepting Christ's love. This fits with modern therapy of accepting your madness is stuck in your head, and that the world still makes sense while learning to love yourself and love the crazy parts of you. In modern society, we have a complicated relationship with evil. Evil is simultaneously a social construct and isn't real, but at the same time when someone says something we disagree with, they are pure evil and must be cancelled. This is a complicated argument that deserves a 40 minute video, but the reality is that in the real human condition we live in, no one really doesn't believe that there isn't a good and evil. Once you say good and evil don't exist, you have to accept that a man who rapes and tortures his daughter to death should be treated the same as Jesus or Buddha. No one would say that. Isn't it funny how the people who say evil doesn't exist then immediately use that to justify doing something evil? Once you remove evil, you remove the argument for why genociding your opponents isn't really that bad. When people argue that good and evil don't really exist, they don't believe it, at least with their actions, they just want to confuse you enough so you can't resist. In the same way that a physical plague can rip across a society when conditions aren't set up right, we have a long history of psychological or demonic plagues destroying society. 
As I said, you won't notice them until they're pointed out, but what separates the totalitarian phases the modern world has gone through from a demonic plague? Look at the French Revolution, Soviet Russia, Maoist China, or Nazi Germany. In each of those societies, people rejected any objective standards, or God, and said that man was capable of becoming a god himself and building a perfect world, and then their actions involved killing people in the most horrifying ways, destroying the society, freedom, and hurting people. These are some of the most horrifying events in history. Afterwards, everyone reasonable around the world could agree that these were bad ideas. How is a psychological plague of people doing horrible things that they wouldn't have done before different from a demonic plague taking the souls of an entire society and then making them do evil things? One of the things that we just can't come to terms with as a society is sometimes people just do evil things because they're evil. You can often use empathy to explain why someone turns evil, and it always makes sense from a certain perspective. However, how can you explain a parent who tortures their own children, which we know happens, or a government killing millions of its own people? How do you explain how often in the historic record people enjoy torturing their opponents, like the Nazis with the sign, work will set you free at Auschwitz. These people aren't deriving any benefit from this. The evil has just taken over their personality so much that it's become a force in their own right psychologically, where they're doing evil things because they just enjoy being evil. In all the cases before, these acted as plagues, in that beforehand the society was generally pretty normal psychologically, and it was functioning. However, afterwards, often in a matter of months or years, the society descended into complete insanity as people lost any sense of grounding in the world, truth, and people just started butchering each other. This plague spread socially through the population, through culture, incredibly quickly, like a real virus. If you look at societies like this before the French Revolution, Russian Revolution, or Nazi Germany, these were societies where modernity broke down communities, religion, and families where conditions put people into economically unstable poverty, or psychological stabilizers, even though in most cases the society had become wealthier for decades beforehand. I don't see how that's different from how living in shit, overpopulated, starving Europe set the area up for the Black Death, just on a spiritual, psychological base, not physical. We can't come to terms with the traumas of totalitarianism, since our mental model for the human condition is just incorrect. We don't understand how weak and corruptible we are, how when things are set up poorly we can all lose our minds. So far we've been talking about the conceptual framework that could explain how we would have a major psychological pandemic. However, the scary thing is that for crises like this, what's normally the case is that people only realize what the problem with the society is once it's already destroyed the society. <laughs> I believe this is occurring right now with our psychological pandemic. Our society is already being ravaged by this disease, but we just don't have the terminology to talk about it. This is since mental health issues seep into every aspect of society, and we view these problems as discrete things, while the reality is that they all stem from mental health problems. Just from a purely mental health picture, a quarter of the American population has a diagnosed mental health condition. This doesn't include loads of people who really have a mental health issue but just don't recognize it. Your asshole boomer gym teacher who is a narcissist but thinks psychiatry is gay, or your aunt who has undiagnosed OCD which controls her life. For Gen Z, those numbers rise to 40% of the population having a diagnosed mental health condition. I know people like to say that Gen Z fakes mental illness, and this is true to a certain degree. There are a lot of kids on TikTok pretending to have mental illnesses that they don't for clout. However, what I'd say is that if you're faking having a mental health condition, in a lot of cases, that extreme need for validation shows that you have a different mental health issue. 90% of Gen Z has anxiety, 80% have depression, 90% have had burnout in the last year, and close to 90% feel lonely on a regular basis. Half of young men have contemplated suicide, a quarter of Gen Z has contemplated suicide, and 10% of Gen Z has attempted to commit suicide. 40% have long-lasting feelings of lack of purpose and depression. 90% of Gen Z has said their mental health has gotten in the way of their lives and lowers their energy and initiative. As a person who's a member of this target demographic, I can't write this off. Having met 
thousands of people in my age category, I try to talk to them about their struggles, and this is a genuine, real problem that older people just tend to write off as teens being dramatic. That's not true. This affects the toughest and hardest-headed members of the demographic as much, if not more, than the rest. It's really impossible to judge someone's inner struggles based on their outside success. There's a reason Harvard and Cornell is one of the highest suicide rates of any colleges in the country. A lot of Gen Z is just incapable of functioning on any level. As a person who's 22, I know loads of people who are too anxious to take phone calls, go on trips out of their hometown, get jobs, hear contrary political opinions, sleep over at a friend's house, go out to get drinks and more. Older people might not believe me, but a significant part of Gen Z is completely incapable of functioning in the real world. A story I said in a previous video, which no one saw, but which I'll repeat since I think it's telling, is that I was visiting my 15-year-old cousin. We were at dinner and I asked if he wanted to stay the night at my Airbnb 15 minutes away since I had an extra bedroom. It took him half an hour to work himself up to do it since he saw it as a big risk, even with his parents' encouragement. He only wanted to stay at my place another 15 minutes since he felt too anxious. The problem here is I don't think that this sort of thing is abnormal, especially for certain sub-demographics in parts of the country. The thing is that a lot of people want to blame Zoomers, and I think that's partly true since we're all responsible for our actions when everything's said and done. However, the oldest Zoomers are 25, which means the fault really lies at the hands of their parents who raised them like this. I think the reason for the psychological collapse is multivariable, and due to a combination of breakdowns in religion, community, social feminization, urbanization, and more. Gen Z's helicopter parenting, where parents wouldn't let their kids play outside for fear, or were constantly shepherding them from event to event, creates a population which is incredibly anxious, given they never had enough autonomy to prove themselves to create self-confidence. It's also indicative of their parents themselves being incredibly anxious and unwell. Imagine explaining helicopter parenting to any other era of history, and they just tell you to loosen up and grab a beer. I don't want to discount the rest of the population's mental health problems. I just want to use Gen Z as a capstone example for the group that has it worse. Middle-aged men are hit really hard, where for the first time in American history, middle-aged white men saw a decline in lifespan due to deaths of despair. Middle-aged women are the target demographic for antidepressants, which are at the highest usage rates in history. The mental health crisis is eating our society alive. Just for a zoom out, let's look at how our society operates on a group level, because remember, a society's actions on the macro group scale are indicative of what the individuals in the society are feeling. Our culture is literally trying to commit suicide. We hate everything about ourselves. The West flagellates itself for being Western. Nihilism and self-loathing is never justified. If Hitler would have somehow realized that what he did was evil, and he wanted to improve, if he went into a spiral of self-hating, that would accomplish nothing. Rather, he should have taken responsibility for his own actions, accepted what he did was wrong, and then think of ways to improve, and that nihilism would get in the way of him improving his actual character. Love and self-acceptance is the foundation of all mental health, and if you hate yourself, it's very difficult to improve. We all make mistakes, and that's okay. Also, we hate any concept of greatness. If you go out on the internet and say you like something, loads of people will try to tear that down, for example, if I say I think Alexander the Great was a military genius, you'll have loads of comments saying, oh, he really wasn't. If I go online and say I like a movie, there'll be a bunch of comments saying, oh, that movie's terrible. And I think of fashion where there's no way to dress correctly in modern fashion. I choose to just wear a polo and chinos because that's kind of classy, but also it's not classy enough where it's kind of cringe. But the thing is, every single way you would dress in modern society sets up you to be criticized by a different group. So I've been called a yacht boy as an example, and there's no way to do things correctly in society, and anyone who aspires to do anything that is better than average gets mocked because we can't pretend to believe in anything because believing in anything's not cool. What cancel culture and what our modern culture wants is for you to grovel on the ground and beg to not 
believe that you can amount to anything, since if you're not part of a protected class, if you want to work hard, follow your dreams, reach your goals, you'll be mocked for being a tryhard or for being a normie. Being happy is not cool in our society. You're supposed to be an edgy rebel. And if you just want to live a life where you have a family and you're content with what you're doing, we'll mock you for that. One of the things with mental health is that if you have severe depression, you talk to your therapist. Your therapist's goal is that you feel mindfulness and contentness with yourself no matter what's going on in your life. There is no place where being incredibly depressed and hating yourself is useful. Nihilism has no place in therapy. The place where our society is, is that we constantly think of ways where we're terrible, and our culture's collective subconscious is that of an incredibly depressed person. What very mentally unwell people do is that they think of loads of weird theological and philosophical justifications for why they are either amazing or why they are terrible. If you talk to a schizophrenic person, they'll have a lot of conversations about God and Satan and all that sort of thing. And grandiosity is a way that people balance their complete lack of self-assurance in themselves as individuals. And this is what we do, where rather than thinking about actual problems like maybe we should be better to our communities or we should support belief structures that make us happier or we should deal with the actual problems in our lives like how we've been driving down wages or how normal people can't make it, we develop these hyper-complicated philosophic structures that simultaneously say that we're terrible, but also we are the most enlightened people in history. And we're at the point where the best model for how modern Western societies act are the inhabitants of mental wards. To jump back to the previous topic, this mental health crisis hits men and women in very different ways. Young female mental health issues have skyrocketed over the last 20 years, largely due to the rise of social media. Social media puts female relational warfare, or GSR, being gossiping, shaming, and rallying, on an industrial scale. This means that young women are in a constant state of relational conflict, and seeing their friends do things without them spreading rumors or making themselves feel terrible, since other girls look better than they really do through filters. As men, this stuff might seem silly, but remember, women value and view the world through relationships, so it's incredibly important for women's lives. And you see that in the young female suicide rate has quadrupled in the last 20 years. John Haidt covers this really well in his book, The Coddling of the American Mind. It's interesting to see this trend of young women having mental health problems, since I'm yet to meet a girl under 25 who doesn't have some serious mental health problem. At this point, I treat it almost as a game, where I try to guess in advance which mental illness she has and see if her mental illness clashes with mine. Dating with Gen Z girls is totally reflective of this extreme anxiety. Guys ask girls to hang out rather than on dates since it's more effective, since going on a legit date is too much pressure. Gen Z is something called situationships, in which you hang out and maybe have sex, but the people involved are too anxious to have a real relationship, which need I remind you, can be cancelled at any time. I study different demographics, social codes, and cues for fun as a hobby, since my speciality is anthropology. And Gen Z's is based around anxiety mitigation in every single way. When you talk to a Gen Z person, try to speak in a way that doesn't trigger any kind of anxiety reaction. This GSR has been reflected back into the society through cancel culture and radical leftism. If you look at the demographics of people who are part of the woke left, it's basically mentally ill young women. Look at this chart for sex and mental health issues to see that young, woke women have four times the rate of mental illness of any other demographic. If you ever wonder why the far left acts insane, it's since it fits the literal definition of being filled with insane people. The way our society works, and I've explained this in my video on feminism, is the end goal of feminism is allowing women to abdicate any responsibility so that a woman can't be judged negatively for anything and can never have her emotions hurt. What's happening here with woke therapy speak is they try to avoid triggering or emotionally painful things, which just makes their mental health problems worse, which becomes a cycle. By giving your mental problems more power over you and not confronting them, the demon just keeps growing.
The left doesn't love the meek. Whenever it gets power, it turns them into slaves and starves them. It hates the great. That's why the left hates good art, the great men of the past, or values like honor, responsibility, or God, religion, and the family, of whom some have done some of the most of anything in history to help the meek. The left hates being held to any standards and so lashes out at those who try to uphold any source of order. This is why the left loves demonic imagery and uses it in their art. In the crisis to come, the left will try to destroy those who keep the society sane so we can all descend into their shared madness. This is what happened with the Khmer Rouge, Stalin, or Mao. The left is happy to swim in its own shit as long as everyone else is stuck there with them. Things are going to get really crazy. I ran an experiment where I looked up the most depraved things I could possibly imagine, including cannibalism or pedophilia. Mainstream leftist outlets have been writing articles for years defending them. Over the next few years, the left will descend into evils that we can't even possibly imagine now. I mean, is there any other way to understand the modern left except through suicide? The left hate the societies they are a part of and want to destroy them. They literally say that. They hate reproduction, with many viewing being a mother as evil. They hate culture, history, tradition, and the things that make us, us. They are pushing policies that actively grind their economies into the ground in the name of climate change. They are literally championing degrowth. The left is so depressed it is trying to commit cultural and social suicide. The thing is that we haven't even gotten to the mental health problems among young men, which in their own way are nearly as bad as those with young women. The problem here is that when young women go crazy, the worst thing that happens is the birth rate collapses. When young men go crazy, the entire society burns down. Young men today have stunningly poor mental health. They suffer incredible amounts of loneliness, depression, alienation, and more. Unlike women as well, where society is completely catered to young women's emotions, society tells young men they're terrible and offers them no resources at all, spitting in their faces. Every aspect of our society tells men that they're horrible, and there's nothing they can do to redeem themselves except grovel on the floor. If you talk about the issues facing young men at all, you're reflexively called an incel, even in cases where it's ludicrously silly. There's an African quote I've used a few times before that when the young men don't have a place in the village, they'll burn it down to feel its warmth. This is a topic I've covered in much greater depth in this video. The short answer is that modern society gives young men no incentive to work inside the system and lots of incentives to destroy it. Let's break this down. 94% of new company hires since COVID have been non-white, meaning especially as young men are trying to enter the job market, you just can't get a job. The economy is so broken, we don't really have social mobility, and it looks like AI will wipe out the jobs we have left. Two-thirds of young men under 30 are single. I think it's around 80% of guys in their early 20s. 30% of men under 30 are virgins. Even if they get married, there's a 50% chance of a divorce where the wife takes the kids and a majority of a man's income for him having done nothing wrong. The ruling class views young men with complete contempt, and every facet of culture tells young men they're terrible. At the same time, young men hold all the cards of physical force in society. They staff the military, police, or gun owners, and young men wage war. Society is basically goading young men to destroy it at this point. When shit hits the fan, the right can completely destroy the left. The right has the military, the police, young men, and especially aggressive young men, and the left thinks owning guns, hierarchy, discipline, the military, and standards are morally wrong. I've covered this in these two videos. Unless there's a major variable I'm miscalculating, the right would crush the left in a matter of weeks in a civil war. However, with the modern right, there's very little ideological unity, with the right spanning everything between eugenicists, fascists, libertarians, Petersonians, Christian fundamentalists, and more. This means that once the right wins, it would in turn split into factions. As a person who's part of this process, and who's seeing what's going on in the digital right right now, the speed at which the right is moving further extreme scares me. At this point, legitimate fascism, theocracy, or things that fit the literal definition of Nazism are accepted political positions. The right isn't that far today from genetically engineering a race of supermen to enslave the world, or going full Handmaid's Tale. The demons aren't just on the left. A point to keep in mind is that for sexually frustrated young men, their two biggest female influences, culturally, are porn and feminism. 
One of them makes them view women with contempt and as sex objects, while the other makes them despise them as insane, annoying shrews. Over history, women have used their purity and kindness to counterbalance men's incredible superiority in organization, physical force, and creation of geniuses. However, having thrown that card away means I expect really nasty things to happen to women over the next few decades. In Japan, there's a term called the hikikomori, and they're a sub-demographic of mostly young men who stay at home and play video games, and many are scared to even leave their rooms or go outside their houses. And I was waiting for years for there to be a Western equivalent, because I think for all the reasons we've discussed before, that we're going to be seeing a lot of Western hikikomori in the future. And I recently found one, that being the term neat, which is not in education, employment, or training. And although I am not a neat, I can understand why a lot of young men want to do this, because in the horrifying labor and dating markets we have now, there's not a lot of reward for just effort or social mobility. And at the same time, like playing video games is fun. And with the psychological mental health pandemic going on, I see the hikikomori being a growing group of the population, and I worry that they're going to end up becoming a very significant minority of young men. Almost every government organization in America is on the verge of bankruptcy. This is true of the national government, states, and is most true of cities or municipal governments. What this means is the breakdown of law and order, especially in major cities, since people just can't pay the police. We're already seeing this mass crime and breakdown of authority. It breaks my heart to see my home city of Philadelphia become dangerous. I lived in downtown Philadelphia for five years and would go jogging at midnight and would walk around the city every day and I never had a crime problem. Now the best parts of the city are experiencing looting and shootings. This is getting to be true of most major cities in America outside red states. What this means is the breakdown of normal authority. If the centralized government defaults, as it appears it may soon, what happens next? We don't really know how to operate a government that doesn't exist. This chaos opens up a lot of space for blood and chaos. What I worry about is the breakdown of law and order as random thugs and strong men insert themselves into power in the chaos. I really worry about mass rape, theft, burning the rich's property, and more. I could see the army intervening in and installing martial law as a way to maintain order. Something that makes me worried is that the French and Russian revolutions, or the Nazis, were occurring in societies that were psychologically more stable than ours. They had what were, by our standards, intact families, more left from religion, social codes, and friend groups. What that means is that we're primed for things to get even crazier and more brutal, since we have less of an immune system against that. I think things will get ugly in ways I can't even imagine. The thing is, I'm not crazy, and I can't predict how an entire society of crazy people will act. I expect bizarre cults to appear, some literal demon worship, horrifying atrocities, and more. The only thing I know is that things will be bad. This video has so far kept our perspective pretty short term. However, over the next century or so, what are the implications of this? There's a reason this is a video on a new Black Death, and so far I've been predicting political conflicts in the near future. The reason I compare our era to the Black Death is there was a horrible disease that halved the civilized world's population over the 1300s. The Black Death was incredibly traumatic, but in its wake left a better world, since the collapse of half the population raised wages and wiped out the decaying medieval civilization in exchange for the Renaissance, Age of Exploration, Science, and Reformation. We have a key similarity with the world before the Black Death, that being the start of a secular cycle. I've talked about this before in so many previous videos that I'll keep this short. However, roughly every 250 years you see a major social crisis caused by an overabundance of labor driven in many cases by population growth, which causes inequality to skyrocket and rural people's wages to collapse to survival levels. This is a text wall to fully explain this process. What then occurs is a series of horrifying wars or plagues that causes the population to reset. Examples of this in recent Western history include the Russian and French revolutions, the wars of religion in the 1600s, and the Black Death. Further back, the Bronze Age collapse, the fall of the Roman Republic and Empire, or the fall of Chinese dynasties. Peter Turchin has built computer models that predict this to the exact years they've taken place over history, 
with controlling for the variables such as income inequality, elite overproduction, and wage stagnation. His computer models in 2010 predicted America and the rest of the world would by extension have a crisis like this in the 2020s. The natural order is often deeply ironic in that it uses the opposite cause to reach the same result. These kinds of cycles are necessary to the world as a way of balancing out and changing things healthily. Thus, the natural order will make sure they happen. That's how the world's GDP has gone up over 10 times over since 1900, and we've gotten all these incredible labor-saving devices, but most people are only still barely getting by, even in the wealthiest countries. However, another ironic example is that before these crises, it's normal for the population to be starving and thus ineligible for military service or hard work. We got the same result today, where the U.S. military estimated three-quarters of young men are ineligible for military service due to obesity and mental health issues. Obesity has had similar results to starvation in pre-modern societies by rendering large parts of the population incapable of hard physical work. Obesity also lowers reproductive fitness in the same way as starvation would, although of course it's nowhere near as unpleasant. An interesting thing is that mental health problems are slated to indirectly crash the world's population by half over the next century, in the same manner that plagues did in the 1300s. Collapses in birth rate are incredibly stark over the entire world. Basically every country except the very most desperately poor have unsustainable birth rates. Birth rates keep crashing, and it's unclear if they're going to stabilize anywhere. They're going to start breaking countries like China, Germany, Japan, or Russia soon. The U.S. has some more breathing room, being the youngest country in the developed world, but we're just buying a few decades. One of the things that really scares me is that these mental health and mating issues are things completely destroying society, but no one in the ruling class will be caught dead ever talking about them. This means that this crisis, which is already happening, will catch us blind and slit our throats. Also, that we are completely lacking in mental models to deal with this. For the entire beginning of this video, I talked about how our society is completely unable to see how we've set up our culture for psychological pandemics. It will take decades to first understand what's going on, then convey it to the population, and then restructure society to deal with it, while at the same time, society falls apart. Gang, I'm sorry to say this, but I think we're going to be dealing with this for the rest of our lives. The thing is that a society aging this fast loses its ability to function on an exponential level. Less young people means more money going to the elderly, less young people means starting less businesses, having less children, and more, which just becomes a horrible cycle. Past a certain point, young people have no reason to work in the system and will rebel, causing further social breakdown. The thing is that the collapse in birth rate is fundamentally a mental health crisis. People could have kids if they had different values. There are loads of people in the third world who cluster families into crappy, crowded tenements and live poor lives. However, we don't want to do that, or have kids at all, really, for fundamentally psychological reasons. I don't blame them. I don't want to have kids now either, but the pressure towards us having an antenatal society is fundamentally in our heads and cultural. I understand this as something where the breakdowns in community, family, religion, and more make it harder to have families, and that's very real. The natural order demanded our population slow down past a certain point, and so we started having mental health issues. Before we end, a brief comparison of our society to every other in history. It's easy to lose perspective when you don't see the big picture. Our society doesn't believe in anything. It openly champions nihilism, hates the family, thinks our culture is terrible, hates its own history, hates its own ethnicity, doesn't think philosophy is real, doesn't believe in beauty, and thinks we should never wage war or expand our nation. This is evidence of a culture depressed to the point of suicide compared to any other ever. Every other culture would tell us we're incredibly nihilistic, and we got real mental health issues. Let me finish with a story, a horrible one that deserves its own video. There was an experiment in the 60s named Mouse Utopia, they did this experiment over 30 times and it got the same results. They put 9 mice into a giant cage which had space for 5,000 mice. They gave the mice as much food as they wanted and made sure there were no plagues. The mice in their numbers rapidly ballooned to over 2,000. Past a certain point they started to see breakdown. Female mice became more aggressive, masculine, raised children improperly, and refused to breed past a certain point. Male mice became effeminate. Their feminine hormones skyrocketed, and they were constantly grooming themselves but not breeding. There were colonies of homeless mice. 
The mouse social structure completely broke down as mice became incapable of maintaining relationships. The mob started destroying the families of the few mice who kept breeding. The mice stopped having children, and their population collapsed until the mouse colony completely fell apart. Doesn't that sound somewhat familiar? Ever since I read the Mouse Utopia experiment, it's haunted me. I worry that this is our future. What can people do about this? I have two answers. I don't want to sound cringe, but fine god. I'll not sell you on which one to choose, and there's a reason every society ever in history is religious. Religion is thousands of years of evolutionary adaptation on how to survive through hard times. Secular ideologies are very easy to warp to mean anything. This is since they're used to serve human nature, which is changeable. This is how the communists justify utopia through killing tens of millions, and how liberalism warped from meaning libertarian to state planning. However, if you believe in objective moral standards in the world, whether or not you realize it translates to God, that's something you can hold on to that you won't be deceived by the ease of sophistry. Religion provides an objective moral standard. As the world keeps changing, you can use God as a rock. Better yet, religion allows group organization and community of other like-minded people where you can help each other out and make sure you, your friends, and your family are safe. However, evil is tricky and always be careful that your religion is not being undermined to fall into the rest of the world's chaos. Religion has been used to justify a lot of evil over history. These kinds of mass psychological pandemics do not occur in religious societies, or only rarely and on much, much smaller scales, such as the Salem witch trials which killed a few thousand total rather than millions like atheist religions. All of the worst tyrannies in history were agnostic since they didn't have any standards to follow and the psychological pressures got too bad. If you're an atheist, I'm not telling you to convert. Do what your heart demands, and trying to pretend to be something that you don't believe in isn't worthwhile. However, what I will say is that on a group level, religious societies are much stronger and much better able to deal with these kinds of threats than non-religious ones. When I've been in my worst parts of PTSD, I always act like I'm on a drug. I never make important decisions when I'm sick or drunk since I'm just not in my right mind. Mental health is like that too. There are points you just can't listen to your thoughts since you know you're in a negative spiral. Almost all nations regret the things they did at their worst points and wish they had kept more of a level head. We need to hold on to our ancestors' standards as a way to keep some sort of objective model as our society's collective brain goes crazy. The second thing is to build groups of like-minded people. Something that gives me hope over the Mouse Utopia experiment is that we're humans, not mice. The sad thing is that the parts of our brain that control for emotion and sex are very similar between humans and mice. However, we have a prefrontal cortex that allows planning. We humans are capable of understanding complex problems and moving beyond our base impulses, as well as working in groups. If we know mouse utopia is occurring, we can do something about it. Some people won't go crazy, and we need to work together if society is to survive. When I see Gen Z, I see a lot of failures, but I also see some of the very most capable people. Gen Z, especially among young men, is very class divided, in which it combines many who border on zombies or NPCs with some who are incredibly driven, capable, and intelligent. The future is still ahead of us, and if we try, we might be able to preserve the sanity of the previous society and prevent the most degrading evils which will haunt us until our deaths and our descendants will feel shame for millennia about.